what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the nature of color and how the eye works and why there are so many different types of color. With only a few exceptions, the color that you find in watercolor, the color you find in oil color, the, the color you find in acrylic color are all the same colors. The pigments that they use are all the same. There are a few limitations. You cannot make lead white in something that's waterborne because when you expose lead to air, it darkens. So you have to completely encapsulate in something that does not contain oxygen or you encapsulate it in something that actually oxidizes, hermetically seals the molecule of color so that it's stable and white. The same was true with ancient formulas of viridian um, and and, and then, of course, there are certain combinations of colors that you can't mix because they react with one another. But by and large, if you buy a tube of alizarin crimson in watercolor, a tube of alizarin crimson in oils, caseins and oils and, and, and acrylics, it all starts off as the same pigment. The difference, now remind you, I, I'm, remember, I'm, I'm no artist here. Stick figures, I, I, I'm good at stick figures. These represent color, little particles of color. The spaces in between have your binder. The material of which creates the film that holds the color together. Now in the case of oil color, this molecule and this molecule and this molecule They don't go anywhere. They oxidize, they dry, they stay, they stay transparent. This is acrylic, very much like this. Only when the binder in acrylic dries, it evaporates. Now, what happens when something evaporates? It goes away, right? It ceases to exist. The water and the volatile compounds that they put in an acrylic binder are designed to evaporate. So they simply go away. And as they go away, these molecules, these little bits of paint, shrink and they collapse in on themselves so that you end up with something that looks like this. Now, for legal reasons, I can't do what I usually do because we're videotaping this. What I would usually do is I would take everybody who's wearing a dark shirt, stand up in front of the class here. And then I take everybody who was wearing a colored shirt and have them stand behind it. And if I pushed all the people that were wearing dark colored shirts together, you wouldn't see the people behind them. And then if I separate them, you'd start to see the colors behind the darker colors. Light is reflection. We know that. And it's actually a really narrow band of colors that we can actually see in our physical world. And what's actually happening when your eyeball is up here and you're looking, the light is actually traveling. It's bouncing around inside this film and then coming back. And it gives you a sense of depth to the color because the light is not hitting a surface and bouncing straight back, which is what's happening here. Your eye is simply seeing directly reflected light. Certainly, there are things that you can do to acrylics to expand them to fill those gaps, to create these gaps. But that's the fundamental difference. Watercolor is exactly the same way, although it works more on a staining level than on a pigmenting level. And you're already, you're dispersing the color across a broader surface. 
but most of us would probably agree that when you work in watercolor, you're working far more two-dimensionally than you are three-dimensionally like this or like this. And you're actually picking up on the luminosity of the paper. So the fundamental difference between most colors and how we see them is how the light actually strikes that color and reflects. That's why colors that dry glossily appear different than matte because it's actually going inside the gloss and it's banging around inside of there and then springing back out. That's why gouache looks different than watercolor. 